Hey, all you rad dads out there. Craig, I really want to thank you for coming to, to join me on the Rad Dad oh, Social. I'm gonna, yeah, and I'm going to start by asking, who are you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Craig Wedren. I'm a dad, um, father of a, an about to be 13 year old boy named Lennon Wedren who's named not after John Lennon, but after um, my wife, Megan Lennon. And and I'm a musician. I was in a band for many years called Shudder to Think in the 80s and 90s. Um, We were sort of an art punk alternative. God knows what we were, but, you know, we were Shudder to Think. And the um, classic Discord records for yeah first few albums right Mm -hmm. and um and then we started composing music for film and television and that's what i do to this day i'm a composer and a songwriter and a singer and a performer and just a general sort of music uh prose tree and and artist i guess um and nice. very 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 much uh engaged with and supremely grateful for my experience as a dad which uh, i was actually thinking about it this morning i'm sure i was thinking about it because of this but i wasn't connecting the thought to the podcast right and um really really just kind of uh marveling and 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 feeling feeling a moment of kind of peaceful gratitude as opposed to you know the insane bustling exhilarating fun that often happens um it was sort of uh i guess it was a quiet i wouldn't go so far as a reflective moment but but i was just like man this is my favorite thing I've ever done certainly my favorite like the most engaging creative project I've ever um endeavored yeah I like that I like that you refer to it as a creative project because it it does feel that way sometimes for sure yeah for sure um and it's totally dynamic it doesn't ever um it, it 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 never it never steadies you never nail it down do you it's always a moving target right yeah um, well, I'm, so I'm going to dig into that in one second. I just want to quickly mention, I saw, as I was doing some reading just this morning, that you did the score for Shrill. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. such funny timing because I just started watching that show over the weekend with my wife. Oh, that's awesome. I yeah, love so, yeah, it's great. So um, I thought that was really funny and um, a really nice coincidence. So I shared that with my wife this morning. Yeah, I do that. Um, I co-compose that with my friend Anna Warrenker, who ha- had a sort of a, a similar parallel trajectory. She was in an L.A. 90s sort of weirdo art pop band called That Dog. Okay. And um, our paths never crossed, although there was so much connective tissue between people we knew. And... Um, and then we were we were parents at the same school. Our kids were at the same school together, and we had had so many mutual friends over the years, and had known of each other and each other's bands, and finally met at a party. Um, and it was just sort of one of those instant things where it was like, oh, we're going to work together. And uh, so we've been doing Shrill and and this other. Um, unfortunately, we we just we just completed the last episode of Shrill, forever last oh. week. So. Um, yeah so it's not it's not going on yeah it was just you know three seasons yeah um i mean it wasn't canceled or anything i think that was always sort of the plan okay you know and uh i'm sure 80s got like a lot of other stuff going yeah, on i'm sure she's busy yeah and so um yeah I, oh, that's I very cool and I'm, I'm gonna miss it because it was just a treat to work with all those gals yeah, you've uh, you've got lots <laughs> lots on the go, that's for sure, and we'll we'll talk about that. Um, I I want to ask you, do you consider yourself a rad dad? A rad dad? Yeah. Can Can I say the f word? <laughs> yeah, you can. Fuck yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. So um, so tell me about that. W- w- 
what's a rad dad to you and why do you consider yourself a rad dad? Well, I mean, I, I, I had a pretty rad dad. Um, okay. he, he was, he was, uh, he was complex. So it wasn't, um, maybe as free and easy as it is with me. And I mean, I'm sure if you talk to my son, he might not say it's so free and easy, <laughs> but, um, but relatively speaking, it's like, yeah. I learned, I learned, a, I took a lot of my own dad's essence, which I think was a love of like absurdity and play and spontaneity and, um, kind of cross, uh, uh, what's the, what's the word? Like cross category, uh, people person-ness. My dad was like very, he could just walk into a room and talk to anybody. You okay. know, he would like, he would make friends with like the homeless guy and with the president of the United States and with like, you know, some gal who was, you know, working floor at a diner and, and he really didn't distinguish between types, which I really appreciated because, um, or I don't know if I was, uh, I don't know if I was quite conscious of it enough to appreciate it at the time, but, but in retrospect, um, I've realized that one of the things I'm, I most enjoy and I'm most sort of naturally, um, I guess, comfortable with, if not good at always is, um, is just being around different types of people mm -hmm. and feeling that kind of sense of community. So, um, you know, w whereas I, I sort of grew up in like an upper, upper middle class, Midwestern uh, Jewish community, Jewish suburb. And, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, othering okay. I think, yeah. that happened. Um, understandably, it's like my grandparents would have been uh, uh, World War II age. Right. And, you know, there, 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 there was, and is a lot of anti-Semitism. So, so there's like a lot of distrust, right? right? Um, which in my opinion is never well served by avoiding the people you distrust. You got to like hang out with people and then everybody, uh, kind of figures it out. Right. You know? Exactly. Um, so my dad, naturally for some reason he always naturally understood that and had that quality to it so so i think i you know i i took things like that from my dad and then uh totally discarded with some of the more rigid um black and white lawyer think that was also part of his personality okay um learned a lot of lessons from his from the way i felt in the high beams of his intense judgment and criticism he was very judgmental he was incredibly dear and like loving above all else but like very very um uh he worried you know and and it would come out in the form of judgment a lot um and he loved to fight you know, he was like a lawyer who loved a fight. And I was just like, you know, so it was always sort of the best of intentions and not always the best of execution of those in right. intentions. And so I learned a lot um, consciously and unconsciously about what I did and didn't want to be if and when I became a dad. Um, so when Megan and I had Lennon, I mean, we were, we were very scared. I always knew I wanted to have a, a kid. Um, and I always felt like one of the things, one of the things that was frustrating and difficult, um, and ultimately kind of limited my life in touring rock band world was that I like community and I like family and I like home. And touring obviously doesn't really lend itself to, right. you know, sustainably to those things. Um, and, um, and I also like making music all the time, like all day, which right. also touring doesn't lend itself right. to. And so um, when Megan and I had a kid after having been like pretty frightened of it for a while, because we were just like selfish New Yorkers, <laughs> you know, 
I would just make music all day and then we would go out at night with all of our friends yeah. and we would get up whenever we wanted and drink coffee. Um, and I was also worried because my parents had such a rough go of it. They got divorced very, very quickly okay. um, soon after I was born. And it was like a sort of a Kramer versus Kramer decade long um, custody battle and just like a, a wow. lot of heartache. And so I was nervous about it because I didn't want, again, I didn't, or I knew it if and when I was going to have a kid and get married, um, I did not want to do it like my parents. Right. Um, I needed to be much more committed and mature and kind of sorted about it than I felt they were. And I think that they would agree that, you know, they were, they were young and dumb and whatever. Not dumb as people, just you know, when they well, in that, their, in their that's culture. part of being being young, right? And and that's a bit of a generational thing too, right? Like lots for sure. of our yeah, our our parents or our grandparents like had kids really young. That was just sort of what you did. And um, so it sounds like you sort of made a conscious decision to wait a little bit or until you felt at least, you know, <laughs> somewhat comfortable. Yeah, to it till we till we felt like we'd, you know eaten all the brunches we could possibly eat and like drank all the beer that there yeah. was in Manhattan. Yeah. And so, and so, so I think, and this is like the very long answer to your wondering, to your asking why I'm a, why I'm a rad dad. Yeah. Why I think I'm a rad dad. Um, so by the time we had Lennon, uh, it really felt so natural and so easy in part because of the lessons um, learned and spurned, mm -hmm. you know, from, from my own family and from my own parents who were wonderful, even though they were, you know, a little effed up. Um, and I, and, and my family was always so tight knit and familial as was and is Megan's. So I just feel like we kind of got, we were able to like, you know, separate a lot of the wheat from the chaff. Chaff, Che, Chaff. And, um, and hopefully, um, you'd have to ask him, but, but, I, but I think Lennon really gets the benefit of that. It's like a very loving, very open, very supportive, yeah. but in certain ways, I guess, traditional, um, you know, we're both Midwesterners and we both really value kind of intellect and questioning and, and, um, you know, a certain type of rigor, but, but without the, the brutality and, you know, the neuroses of right. our ancestors. Hopefully. Right. That sort of traditional approach to parenting. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I like that you talked about kind of your relationship with your dad and, and sort of being able to reflect on that now. So you mentioned it wasn't really a conscious thing necessarily, um, but, but you've had kind of an opportunity to look back and, mm -hmm. and kind of reflect on it. Um, and Craig, I don't know, is your, is your dad still around? No, in fact, we're just coming up on, um, the, the anniversary of his death. He died last May. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. Really sorry to hear that. Thank you. Um, so, okay. So, but your dad, like your, your son would have been about. 11 or 12 when your dad yeah. mm -hmm. passed. So did you see any change in your dad um, after Lennon was born? Yes. Did I mean, it, it was like, it was like, it was like a release. Yeah. It was like a relief. Like he could relax. Like, Isn't that a neat thing? Yeah. It was beautiful. Yeah. Unfortunately, he was, he was uh, starting to deteriorate neurologically. Okay. But, but there were a few, there were a few good years there. Um, and physically, he was starting to kind of crumple. But um, nonetheless, there was like a fundamental shift. Because um, I really feel like, you know, whether it's biological, whether it's like on a DNA level, mm -hmm. or, you know, if it's just that grandparent thing, um, there was for sure a sense that his most important work here was done, you know, Yeah. And that he could, and you know, that everything he had worked for, which was to provide for me 
um, to to and and for and for what he always hoped and what my parents always hoped and prayed would be my family. But you know, I I I wavered, I waffled throughout my adulthood um, because I had a really mixed experience, uh, and I didn't want to pass that on, you know, the negative legacy. Um, so needless to say, both of my um, both of my ever loving Jewish parents were over the moon. Yeah. And when Lenin was born, and he's also, he, he truly is just like a dear, dear heart, Lenin. Um, he's just a sweet guy. And, uh, you know, so, so it was like a double gift. He wasn't a terror. He would like hang out with them. Yeah. It was cool. The relationship between uh, kids and their grandparents, and I'm generalizing here, but it sounds like this was the experience uh for you and uh, for lennon and that was really that was what i got with my grandparents on my mom's side um they were the sort of model couple for me in terms of marriage and in terms of sustainability and in terms of um sort of family and home and hearth so i kind of you know skipped up to them when i was like what the fuck are my parents doing how could they're they're like the 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 dumbest smart people I've ever met. Um, but my grandparents, I mean, I'm sure they, I, in fact, I know they had their troubles, you know, periodically throughout. But by the time I was born, it was all like pretty groovy. And I'm sure it has to do with what you were saying, which is uh, suddenly they had grandkids and they right. could just fill that role, which is like a cakewalk. Right. Um, so I, I think I derailed you a little bit, but you were talking about sort of why you're a rad dad and you were, I think what you were kind of saying was like, we put a lot of thought into it and I, mm-hmm. you know, really try to give my son the experiences that maybe I didn't have, or maybe I, you know, tried to distill those down into what are the, the most important things. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, it, again, just trying to take the best and worst lessons from, yeah. you know, what, what, whatever we were handed and um, kind of re- refine, just like continue to refine. I have no idea the ways in which I'm being a lousy dad. You know, I'm sure I'll hear about that as Lennon gets older. Um, and I'm always, I, and like I want to, you know, like I want, I mean, it, it's like anything. It's like playing guitar or writing songs. It's like, I'm, th- there's so much more that I don't know than yeah. I know. And I wanna know what I don't know um so that i can get better you know it's not like an ego thing for me yeah i really just want to be um a great dad i want to i want to be here to um support and witness him in the best way that i know how um you know so i think a lot of that ha- probably has to do with how i take care of myself um which generally you know i'm 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 much i would say i'm, I'm much more forgiving self forgiving than i used to be like in my 20s um in like the shutter to think era i would say like i was particularly like i really internalized i think a lot of the sort of judgment and perfectionism mm-hmm. that comes from my that everybody in my family has yeah. um and successful people i think do that too i think so too you've you've seen the i think it you're almost kind of conditioned to be that way like i've been a perfectionist and i've set myself up to this high bar Mm -hmm. and it's actually worked out for me so it's a disincentive to move away from that that's right right. so you have to continue doing it in my case i um i got cancer in my 20s and that re and and i had known dimly um in my brain i was always very healthy um, although, although, which is to say, I always exercised and I always and I ate pretty well, um, but I was just vicious inside my head, mm-hmm. and um, and I knew it was something I needed to work on, and kind of sort out. Um, 
but it was always an easy thing to put on the back burner because things were going real well, mm -hmm. just like what you're saying. And because we're, we're, we're at a, a different certain velocity in our twenties, we're like the engines running really hot. Mm -hmm. Um, especially if you have that drive and that, you know, perfectionism and whatever else. And, um, cancer really, really, um, forced me off the playing field for a minute. And, um, kind of like, kind of like what I've been thinking about COVID, the sort of collective in COVID, yeah. um, in a similar way, it's like, we're, we're being forced uh, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like forced reflection. Yeah. So um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, you, so you encountered cancer in your twenties. Mm -hmm. I, I actually did too. Um, did. So I, did... I kind of know what that, that feels like. So I, I, I had read that you, so you had Hodgkin's disease. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. What I did had you testicular talk? cancer Wow. Uh, diagnosed when I was 21. Wow. So right at the end of, I was just kind of finishing up university at that time. And, right. um, but I, I think I know sort of a little bit about what you're talking about, how like in your twenties, like you can't even imagine that I'm going to be, you know, on my ass for six months or a year or longer, like, you know, depending what goes on and, yeah, and you do a lot of reflection, right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you carry a lot of that forward with you. So what was, maybe we can just, you know, step to the side a little bit and you can tell me a little bit about how that affected you as a young man encountering that well i think it really forced me if slowly because you know it's not like a switch that gets flipped mm -hmm. you know any any radical change i think that happens with or, or most radical change that happens within us is is um, evolutionary not revolutionary um or which is to say progressive and you know, kind of water torture yeah. speed. Um, I would agree with that. Yeah, but 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 we can put off. I think it's so easy for us. I like your descendants mode. Mm. But it's so um, easy for us to put off whatever project of change we know we need to. You know, we 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 see it in the mirror. We hear it in our heads. You yeah. know it in our hearts. It's like I gotta work on this thing. It's really easy to not do that. And it's so, and and going back to being a rad dad, it's so important to try and to to get into a practice. To get into the practice of 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 working on, and sort of um, facing oneself. Mm -hmm. um, I think to to be a to be the kind of parent that we all would like to be and would like to have, you know, in our lives. And um, so, so I think, you know, I, I had, I had always been interested in kind of meditation self-transformation, mm -hmm. um, psychedelics, uh, general fitness, um, neuroscience, uh, psychology, you know, all of these things. Um, my dad was like a calisthenics teacher at the YMCA. So he was like super fit, you know, so there were all these sort of different things. And I always liked to, I was always very thinky and so, um, for better and for worse. And so I think after having cancer, I just kind of stopped making excuses. And even though I wasn't able to change as quickly as my doctors would have liked, you know, you got to start going to bed earlier and you can't drink as much and this rock and roll lifestyle, etc. cetera. Um, I just put into practice on a more regular basis things like meditation, which is now a routine part of my everyday life and has the, and, and the benefits of which um, I can't overstate, you know, just in terms of like a long arc of, um, 
I, I would say a kind of compassionate unclenching, um, which was something I struggled with, you know, and, yeah. and, and one of the, and my story of my um, experience with cancer um, has a lot to do with that, a lot to do with like gripping the wheel so hard Mm -hmm. and driving myself so hard and to be able to loosen up around that and even in certain ways just accept that part of myself mm -hmm. rather than fight it you know um i think it set me on a path of um sort of practices that have enabled me to struggle less and to accept myself more um and to just feel better like to yeah. literally just feel happier yeah um and and i'm i'm very very happy that i was able to get some of those things in motion before lennon was born right yeah so um so in everything's in remission though now everything's mm -hmm. good okay good um and you you yeah same good so, yeah it's been um yeah, whatever it is, almost 15 years now. So, Great. Uh, so everything's good. Good. Um, so, yeah, so tell me a little bit more about that. So, and I know, um, you know, mindfulness, meditation, that's uh, something big for you. You've talked a little bit about that now. You've got a, a project um, sort of that started last year, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that sure. um, a little bit later. But um, tell me about how you apply sort of that mindfulness and meditation. How does that apply to parenting? How does that come through in, in your parenting maybe? Well, um, so f for me, and I, I mean, the practice of meditation in general, I think a big part of it for most people is learning to observe the natural processes that happen inside of everybody, which can be um, whatever thoughts, pass by whatever feelings come up and pass that everything comes and goes um, and it's all quite natural and a-okay um, as a parent coming from my parents and generations of parents so I carry a lot of my parents um, worries fears judgments and projections and perfectionism um, as I've had to do with myself, just for my own uh, health and well-being, um, my one of uh, one of my sort of sort of reflexes with Lennon is to worry, judge, and project all my own crap onto him. Um, one uh, among the many things meditation has helped is for me to see that in real time as it's coming up and just be able to like laugh at it, you know, just like, like, oh, there's that, okay, Mr. Guy, there's my dad, there he is. And right. you know, I, I even have names for like the different voices in my head. Like there's Grandma Pearl who worries and there's like Gerald, my dad, who's like judging and, you know, kind of, kind of binding things. And so, so I think pra the practice of meditation and the practice of observing all of our crazy um, comings and goings uh, in real time has helped me un has helped me uh, unconsciously react less right. to um, my son. And there's like, as a parent, and especially with like a, a, a beautifully idiotic 12 year old boy, right? <laughs> Which we all were um, and still are somewhere in yeah. us. Um, you know, it's very, very easy to go down that rabbit hole. Yes. Um, but it's also, I have found, and I, would say that meditation has something to do with this it's very easy not to um without struggling around it you know or maybe there's a little struggle sometimes where it's like yeah. oh, i just i'm gonna strangle you <laughs> and it's like oh here comes here comes uh grandpa yeah 
<laughs> um, so that's that's one of the many things that meditation has helped yeah. with. Well, I think that as a like as a parent, and I, you know, I would maybe I can only speak from my own experience as a dad, but certainly in talking to lots of other dads, that's something a lot of dads struggle with, and I know I yeah. struggle with as a parent is just, and I think it does go back to some of that you know perfectionism too. But I, um, you know, feeling like how could I have screwed that up or why did I say that? Or why did I do that? Or what could, what should I have done differently oh, and beating yourself up over it when, you know, I liked what you said earlier. Um, I've just kind of been thinking about it as we've been talking that there's so much more um, that we, we don't know. And you can yeah. either sort of look at that as um, a barrier, right. And you used the guitar practice. I'm a guitar player too. So yeah. um you can either see that as like, well, I'm not, I'm not good at soloing or I'm not good at whatever. So I'm just not going to do it anymore. Yeah. Or you can look at it as there's this whole world of things out there that I can learn and get better at. And yeah. you, you can apply that to parenting too. You can always get better. Totally. So, so I, yeah, I, I like that idea. Um, yeah. And, yeah, and just too. kind of not being hard on yourself. Right. It's really tough. Yeah. It's, 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 it's tough, you know, because like one false move, Mm -hmm. and you're and and you just feel like the worst yeah person ever to to the person you want to be the best person ever yeah to. yeah um how has being a father changed you craig um oh. well someone's at, the front oh, someone's at my front door Sorry, oh, nice. that. you want to go get it <laughs> You can go get it if you need. No, 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 no. Someone else is home, so we're okay. How has being a father changed me? I, I mean, I, I don't know how it hasn't changed me. It, 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 it's just radical and meteoric, and I can't put my finger on it. Mm -hmm. It has changed me in every way, every cell and fiber of my being. You know what? I think it's just made me more me. It's sort of like a dis, there's a distillation, at least for me, that happens of everything um, of value for me. There's no time for much else. Yeah. And so it really forces me almost on a daily basis to reconnect to the things and to, 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 to my values and what I most value right. and to try and stay focused on that and to check in to make sure that I'm in line with that right. just in, in the way I'm being in the world and in my life because that's all trickling down to him so in a way it has simplified um it, it, as as much as being a father has made life more complex or more complicated in the practical day-to-day -day yes. sense it's really sort of simplified and distilled it in the like human and spiritual sense right like, what's my purpose here? What's my, what am I doing here? Yeah. And also because like, it, like he is simply more important to me yeah. than anything. Yeah. So um, you, you talked about not really ha like you said that you were sort of scared to have kids and you talked a little bit about, yeah. you know, why um, you had some of those fears based on your experience, I think, as a, as a child. Um, but you were kind of ready when that happened. Mm -hmm. Was that transition difficult, though? Um, I'm taking I think it was I think it was much harder for my wife. OK. Um, I think. I think I was like really ready and I didn't even realize how ready I was. But the other side of it is like. I had a whole career happening of film and TV scoring right. um, when we had a kid. So I was like really mid swing with like projects and things. And it was like, 
there was just shit I had to do every single day and like music that needed to get made. Right. Um, and so I had the best of both worlds and my studio has, because we lived in New York for so long, um, my studio has always been in the house or, you know, very near the house. Um, since I was a teenager, since I had like a four track Tascam cassette recorder, yeah. I was like, why would I, why would I want to go there to do this? That was like the problem with being in the band. So we we're like going out on the road to make music. And like, we would only get to make music for like an hour and a half a day. Right. Um, and the rest was like this video game of trying to get to the making of the music part. And, um, and so, you know, so I had a studio in our house. We moved to, first of all, we moved to Los Angeles from New York when Megan was seven and a half months pregnant, which was okay. horrible for her. Um, but because we were, had never had kids before and she had never been pregnant before, we were like, whatever, we're like, cool. We can do like anything. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we've like traveled all over. And so, um, you know, nothing can prepare you yeah. for the seismic big bang level <laughs> shift that happens yeah. when you have a kid. And and then to throw like total up uproot upheaval on top of that, where suddenly we were um, in Los Angeles we are in this little house. It sort of looked like the suburbs from the 1950s, even though we were actually in yeah. um, Hollywood. Um, Megan really freaked out. And she had, like, postpartum depression. But I was working, you know, So, but I was there on premises. So it was like, um, it for me, and it might just be my personality or it might've just been the moment. It was like, everything was new and mm -hmm. everything was thrilling and everything was so exciting and chaotic in the most beautiful way. And, I, and again, I think it was probably be due to this sort of like uh, grounding rod of like purpose and focus. Mm -hmm. It was like everything rearranged itself around the axis or the spine of um, a parenthood in the right. best way. Now, this is this is not the case for everybody that I know. Some right. people have had harder or less hard times of it. Some people have found themselves to be more um, apt uh, parents and some not. Right. Um, so, so I guess in a way I'm just very, very, fortunate um that i loved it so much yeah and, and I still unique, do. unique circumstance that you worked at at home a lot of people over the last year have shifted to you know that lifestyle and kind of getting used to that lifestyle yeah this is like old hat for you that's just what you do same as it ever was less distraction yeah. you know and from, um, a, from a parenting perspective like that you know we talked to lots of guess about the work-life balance like how, how did you kind of navigate that you're at home so I know it's challenging I work from home kind of uh -huh. from this part too and it's tough right kids are up I was I was still I was still at an age and stage where I could like pull all-nighters yeah and so you know like once or twice a week I would just stay up all night and not go to bed and I would do whatever needed doing during the day and then I would get my work done at night and I would just do it um knowing full well that that was not nor that was not sustainable but also being so filled with this like primal love energy um that it felt fine and um and then gradually you know i sort of we we realigned and figured out how to be um healthy well how, how to how to function basically yeah. um but that took a few years so lennon walked through i saw the devo shirt on so what does yeah. lennon think <laughs> about your your past as punk rocker dad and i mean obviously now you're doing lots of film and tv work what does lennon think about all that oh he loves it yeah. um um 
I, I think I think he likes it and I think he gets it. Yeah. You know, like I've never really been separate from the music that I make. I feel like, you know, there's some people who have like a person, I guess everybody has a persona, but there are some people who have a radically different um, character that they inhabit when they're making music, you know, that expresses some like other part of themselves. For me, it's always been more of an integration thing, like very knowable um, as uh, obtuse or sometimes inscrutable as people sometimes think my music and lyrics or whatever can be. For me, I've always felt like, oh, no, no, I'm I'm very knowable. There's really no mystery. It's all in the music. Right. You know, um, I'm not trying to hide or obfuscate. Um, I'm actually trying to connect and be known. And so, so I don't think to him, even though Shutter to Think is uh, before his time, like, I think to him, he sees it and he laughs, you know, it's obviously ridiculous, some of it, but, and, and, um, but he sees it, he's like, oh yeah, that's, it's no different now. <laughs> um, and it really, at least to me, it really doesn't feel different. It feels better. It feels more, it feels healthier and more like sorted, um, uh, less frustrated than it used to be, but it's still just the same um intention and gesture you know so i think i think he gets that what i'm interested in seeing because he plays guitar okay i was gonna ask he's super, you he's super into like he he was in is an insane beatles fan but I, ironically mm. um a george guy not a john guy given his his name and um but he's really into Who's he into? He's he's into Vampire Weekend and Devo and The Strokes. He was really into like guitar music, okay. which is interesting to me because I listen to everything, and I listen to like a lot more hip hop and pop and electronic music than he does. Um, where you know, so I'll get into conversations with his friends yeah. about like whatever you know EDM or you know what's on the radio. Yeah. Um, He's he's a little more, which I can relate to, because I'm like definitely a melody guy. A little, there's a meat and potatoes yep. sensibility yep. in there. He really got that. Um, sorry. Oh, so, um, and he plays guitar. By the time I was his age, I was like singing in bands, and I was like, I knew what I was gonna do. Mm -hmm. There was no question. My parents were not thrilled, but um, I just rammed it through yeah. with everybody. He does. He's not like possessed in that way that I was. So, but he's like very steady and consistent. Like I was terrible in guitar lessons. Yeah. I never practiced. I was lousy at guitar for until, you know, I. I finally started learning how to play guitar because I wanted to write songs, because I needed to write songs. Right. So gradually over the years, I got to be pretty good. Um, but he's actually, he actually practices and is like learning music and how to play guitar. Not voraciously, but like really kind of slow and steadily. So I'm super curious as he becomes a teenager, if and how it's all going to connect or if it's just not his trip. You know? That's always an interesting thing, right? Like, it, um, I love talking to musicians about that. Like, you know, what they're because some people feel quite strongly, like, oh, I really want my kids to learn to play an instrument or kind of be mm -hmm. just like dad, and others are kind of like, well, let's see where it goes. And mm -hmm. um, you you, you kind of think that just all that music being around, and you know, you're you're working there. You've got obviously you've got a sort of studio set up there, yeah. I'm sure, and um, you know lots of toys for him to play with and learn. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see um, what happens over the next few years if, if he gravitates to that or not. But I mean, ha you know, having all this here is like, I mean, is it the equivalent of, you know, my dad's like legal pad yeah. and like rubber stamps? <laughs> I don't know. 
Yeah, my dad was out working on cars in the garage when I was uh -huh. a kid, and I never took any interest in yeah. that. So, I mean, yeah. It's just, <laughs> Yeah, yeah it'll, be, it'll, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, I guess the real question is, because for me and for so many boys, um, at least back in the day, it, it was when, when, when you wanted to start attracting the attention of people you were attracted to, yeah. right? That you get in a band, but I don't necessarily think that it doesn't hold the like kind of um mystery or sexy cachet that it used to that's right yeah um well that's really interesting so what what are you working on right now craig tell me a little bit about your projects right now um so so right now in my sort of day jobs i'm working on a bunch of tv shows there's one um uh really beautiful medical drama for nbc called new amsterdam right. um and shrill and uh, a new tv show for the cw network called the united states of terra uh, sorry oh my god i can't believe i said that i did the music for the united states of terra like 10 years ago it's called the republic of sarah <laughs> oh okay <laughs> that's very the similar republic, the republic of sarah um it's not out yet and um and then on the personal side, I'm doing a kind of every six weeks singles and video series called The Dream Dreaming, right. which I was going to do it as just like a record, um, but it really didn't, th this fit better with the way my life is right now to just always be working on a song in the video. Right. Um, so during COVID, I got like, you know, 15 or 20 songs kind of up to a certain point that I feel like I can always be tinkering with them and playing with them and kind of finishing them. Yep. Um, and I started making videos. I sort of turned the live room in my studio into a little video making space. Cool. Um, so I'm releasing that over the next year and then I'll probably put out a proper album of it. Um, and then I've been doing these things called sabbath sessions which are like you were saying before my sort of musical meditation practice um and that's just improvised ambient vocal looping meditations i guess for lack of a better word yeah. um very psychedelic um i think pretty unique you know it's uh i i I do them around town. Sometimes I'll do it with like friends who are yoga teachers and we'll sort of share the space. Yeah. Um, and so I guess people sort of refer to them as sound baths, but they're not really anything like your typical sound bath, you know, with like bells and bowls yeah. and things. It's literally just um, a sort of uh, sonic choral magic right. carpet ride. Yeah, I had to listen um, to some of them before. And I want to ask you, like, those are kind of released in a, like a podcast type format. Yeah, I, I did a season of them as a podcast. Okay. Um, but I, it's one of those, it's one of those forms where I don't know quite how to um, present it. It works great live. Mm -hmm. um, because like you're in the space and it's really uh, visceral. Um, and everybody can do whatever they want. There are people who draw or people who just sleep or people who just kind of cuddle or people who meditate or people who do yoga um, or people who just listen like it's a, a concert. Yeah. Um, so it's very chill and like non-prescriptive in that sense. It's not like it, it's sort of less performative, I guess, than, than you know, song based live music. Um, but it doesn't really lend itself to album format. It it sort of is cool. Like I released a volume of them, uh, you know, on streaming services. But I mean, three of them, and it's like an hour and a half. It's, you know, so it's sort of like an hour and a half long EP. I don't even know kind of what it is. And so, um, 
So I thought, oh, maybe a podcast would be good. And I can like talk a little bit at the beginning and talk a little bit at the end and then just do a performance. Um, but then it's so funny. It harkens back to the 90s when Shutter to Think was like, okay, we're, we said to Epic Records, we were signed to Epic. So yeah. we're like, okay, we're going to do, we're going to start doing film soundtracks now. And they were like, well, what the hell are you talking about? You're a rock band, right? It was like this or this. Yeah. And so I did these podcasts of um, Sabbath sessions and some of the, some of the platforms removed it because it's music, yeah. because it's original music. And I'm just like, come on, you guys, like we're inventing, you know, we're, we're experimenting with these new forms and formats. Like, isn't. Yeah. How like, people can consume something. Right. Yeah. Experience but something. I'm, but I'm sure that whoever was Apple or Spotify or whoever it was who took it off, I'm sure that they were like, I'm sure they have deals with the old guard, right. Whether it's the record levels or right. management or God knows what uh, publishing, and that podcasts are for this yeah and you know never the twain shall meet so i'm still kind of trying to figure out the best way to get it out in into um a non attendant yeah non-traditional um, sort of yeah uh, medium well, that's really interesting yeah i was doing them at the beginning of covid i i was doing them every day on facebook which was okay. great like facebook um, live mm-hmm but um, that got to really be a lot, I think, right. for me and for others. <laughs> well, it, that was kind of an interesting thing, though, like when that all kind of started about a year ago, right? Mm -hmm. Like there was a lot happening, Facebook Live, Instagram Live, there were artists yeah. that were just kind of trying to, it was really cool, actually, because yeah. kind of trying to meet a need there, right? People were cooped up, people were looking for something happy, something inspiring, and so to yeah. kind of have that connection with an artist it was really neat like i remember i, I, I agree watching those all day long yeah yeah i mean i i was i remember particularly watching john doe from x every day he was like just playing folk songs and country songs on instagram it was the best and ricky lee jones was like yeah. doing live concerts from her living room which were insane um yeah everybody was doing it it felt like everybody was doing it yeah you know, it was a lot. Yeah, it but was it was it was cool. It was kind of that little sort of you know, um, light in the darkness. You know, yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so very quickly, just to come back to the dream dreaming, and then mm -hmm. so you've released two songs now with yeah. videos. So mm -hmm. on my tongue and going sane. And I thought yeah. it was interesting. We're talking about kind of parenting. Your son Lennon. There's a connection with the first video, right? Oh yeah, he's in it. <laughs> yeah. And and some creations of his I read, right? So Oh yeah, yeah. Oh Adam yeah, here, I'll, I'll show you. It's it's uh Oh it's yeah, there they are. The squad. Yeah. I, I mean I think he made these when he was like nine or eight or something. That's but cool. they seem they, they always sit they always sit there on my couch and protect the studio, so I figured it was time for their close up. Yeah. Oh well, that's awesome. Kinda neat to be able to to work your family into some of those videos too. And oh, I know totally. your wife had something to do with both of the videos, I think. Yeah, she, she shoots them. And I mean, she's, she also um, runs the business side okay. of my, of our, our, my, I don't know, music and composing situation. Yeah. Um, so she's like fully the, um, the stakes in the tent. Yeah. So it's so a family really endeavor. Cool. That's really neat. Yeah. Um, Craig, I, I want to thank you so much for of your course. time today. It's been really great talking to you. It's so um, nice talking given, to you. Given me a lot of things to think about. Do you have any um, advice for anybody out there listening? Maybe it's new dads or um, dads to be um, or, you know, or any of our listeners. Yeah, I think just like forgive yourself. You know, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're going to okay. screw up every once in a while. You're, yeah, it's going to be you're fine. Okay. Yeah, I like that. I like that. Well, thank you so much. It was really nice talking with you today. So nice talking. Yeah. Thank you.